Time now for our Wall Street Week Daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day around this time. And David, there's been so much focus this year on artificial yeah. intelligence. And let's get beyond the hype here and really start to talk about how this stuff is actually going to be applied. And specifically in the medical area, healthcare area, we talked with Dr. Lloyd Miner. He's the dean of the Stanford School of Medicine about this subject. He's given a lot of thought. He, think, he thinks it's a transformative moment for medicine and healthcare. I think the transformative aspects of generative AI can be broken down into several categories. One is making healthcare delivery more efficient and effective and equitable. Efficient in that physicians, other healthcare providers will have access to information in real time and in ways that actually inform decisions about the care of individual patients. Effective in that hopefully we'll eliminate a lot of unnecessary testing, a lot of procedures or activities that don't directly link to the well-being of the patient and equitable because it'll provide access, particularly access to specialty services that today are not widely distributed in our country and certainly in the world. I wonder about the distributional aspect of that, of the delivery that you refer to, because there is an issue in this country that not all people get equal access to health care. We certainly saw it during the pandemic. Uh, is this an area where AI could make a particularly disproportionate contribution to the healthcare system? Yes, David, I think it really is an area where it can have a disproportional disproportionate favorable effect. So we know, for example, an example I like to uh, draw is in dermatology. There are dermatologists certainly in big metropolitan areas like here in New York, uh, but there are certain regions of the, countries, of the country that don't have dermatologists or that have them and they're so busy that it's hard to get an appointment. Our computer scientists working with our dermatologists uh, developed an algorithm uh, that will, from a picture taken of a skin lesion, can as accurately make a diagnosis of whether or not that's cancer or not as a trained dermatologist looking at the same lesion. Now, the dermatologist does better when they're actually examining the patient than just a picture. The point is that offers the opportunity for a physician in rural America that may not have access to a dermatologist for a couple of hours away uh, to be able to accurately screen a lesion and know whether or not that patient needs to see a dermatologist or not. Which may lead to a critical distinction. You have a doctor involved in all of that. It's not that right. generative AI replaces the doctor. It's not substitution of the doctor, but augmentation allows the doctor to do a better job, faster, and more broadly distributed. That's right. And when we started deploying AI in the interpretation of radiology images, which was several years ago, five, six, seven years ago, uh, there were rumors going out that there weren't going to be radiologists anymore. And uh, that was, of course, false. And I think there will always be a need for radiologists. And there will be radiologists who know how to use AI and do deploy it in their practices. And there will be those that don't. And in the end, those that do and use it responsibly are going to provide the better care. And, and be able to deliver care more effectively. We've been talking about delivery. Let's talk about another aspect of healthcare, and that is actually the underlying services, and particularly something called synthetic biology, which you have talked and written about. Tell us about synthetic biology and what that could do to healthcare. Synthetic biology refers to engineering life. It involves taking a cell, altering it to do another function. And already today, we're using synthetic biology, for example, in therapies for cancer, where we engineer a person's own uh, immune system cells in order to attack cancer in ways that those cells wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But in the future, we'll be able to engineer life to do other things as well. It has, can have enormous implications in sustainability, for example, where we may be able to engineer life to do better carbon capture or uh, make microorganisms that dissolve plastics. But with this opportunity to change cells, to alter their metabolism, their gene expression, goes the opportunity to really rethink problems that we haven't been able to confront in the past. What you're describing is a very different world uh, of medicine and of research for that matter. You were dean of the Stanford Medical School. How does this change how you train the next generation of physicians and, for that matter, research scientists? I think it's going to have a radical uh, effect on the way we educate uh, physicians, physician scientists, and scientists. When we, an institution like Stanford, when we have the privilege of working with students for four, five, six, how many other years, we're actually trying 
in, in our training programs to prepare them for 30, 40 years of productive uh, life after that. So we're training learners more than we are imparting facts of the moment or knowledge of the moment. Generative AI, large language models, particularly as they incorporate other representational data like images, that radically changes the type of knowledge and ability that people being trained today need to have. There's less emphasis, there will be less emphasis on memorization, more emphasis I think on truly understanding and in particular understanding what these models are doing and how they can be responsibly deployed and trained. If you were going to guess, do you believe generative AI in the end will make medical practice more attractive or less attractive to young people coming into the field? Well, I hope it makes it more attractive because the more that we can responsibly deploy technology in the delivery of health care, the more we should be able to get physicians and other health care providers back to what they really want to do, and that is interacting with patients during critically important moments in their lives. Unfortunately, in the past, technology, when it's initially implemented, has oftentimes been a barrier to health care providers interacting with patients. I think those barriers are about to be dramatically lowered because of the improvements in the technology. The world you describe is an attractive world, a lot of benefits from generative AI. Where are there risks? There are always risks with any powerful tool. There are many risks. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration published an executive order on sort of the future of AI. And a key component in that statement is a focus on patient privacy. We absolutely have to keep that in mind. And that also means data security, uh, which is linked to AI and other developments in technology. We also have to keep in mind that these models are only as good as how they're trained, the data used to train them. And if that data is biased, then the outcome, the predict predictions of the model is gonna be biased as well. So there's, those are some of the risks that we have to keep in mind. I think we can responsibly manage, I think we have to responsibly manage those risks but first comes the awareness of what the risks are.